Welcome back to our lecture series, Math 4230, Abstract Algebra 2 for students at Southern Utah University. As usual, I'll be your professor today, Dr. Andrew Misseldine. And so in lecture 32 here, we are going to continue our discussion of uh, polynomial codes leading up to what we call a BCH code, which we'll, devi we'll define that in the last video for lecture 32. Um, in the meanwhile, though, in preparation to define BCH, H codes, we have to talk about roots of unity, for which in the in the prequel Math 4220 Abstract Algebra 1 to this lecture series, we did introduce complex roots of unity, which would be the roots of unity over the rational field um, and basically every other uh, field of well, every other field contained inside the complex numbers, we'll put it that way. Um, we are actually going to take an opportunity right now to extend the notion of a root of unity, um, also in particular a primitive root of unity, uh, to over, we want to define a root of unity over any field. Um, this will include finite fields, which will then have applications to our coding theory here. Uh, so let F be a field. Um, this could be a finite field, it could be an infinite field, it could be characteristic, characteristic zero, characteristic P, uh, it doesn't matter. Just take any field um, and we'll say that zeta is some element of that field. We say that zeta is an nth root of unity if zeta to the n equals 1. Um, another way of saying that is that if you take the polynomial f of x to equal x to the n minus 1 and you view this as an f polynomial here, then f evaluated at zeta is then equal to zero. So we say that zeta is a root of unity um, if it's a, a root of this polynomial, x to the n minus one, which of course is equivalent to saying that the nth power of zeta gives you one. Now, we say, much like we did before with complex numbers, we say that zeta is a primitive um, root of unity if no smaller power accomplishes this. Uh, so for example, you know, if you take zeta to be a primitive sixth root of unity, then we're going to see that, of course, zeta squared is also a sixth root. Because um, after all, if I take zeta squared and I raise that to the sixth power, you're going to end up with, well, by exponent laws, whoops, this is the same thing as zeta to the sixth squared, for which, of course, zeta to the six is one. So you end up with one squared, which is then one. So zeta to the zeta squared is also a sixth root of unity because zeta was a sixth root of unity, like be, like we, like we have right here. But of course, zeta squared is not a primitive sixth root because while the sixth power does give you one, um, notice instead that if we take zeta squared and we take that to the third power. Uh, this will actually end up, again, by exponent laws, this is the same thing as zeta to the 2 times 3 power, zeta 6, so this is equal to 1. So the third power of zeta 6 will get you there. Um, and in fact, one can argue that zeta squared here, if zeta was a sixth root of unity, zeta squared will actually be a primitive third root of unity. Um, and so the, these are relations we saw previously when we talked about complex roots of unity. Uh, so next... Um, I want to introduce the symbol phi sub n of x, and this is a polynomial in f of join x, and this will denote the minimal polynomial of zeta over f, and we call this the nth cyclic tonic polynomial. Um, and admittedly, for the for the, over the rational field, uh, there is one and only one uh, cyclic tonic polynomial for each. Uh, for each uh, root of unity class n, like so. Um, and in that situation, over the rational numbers, the degree of this cyclic tonic polynomial, phi of n, is actually equal to phi of n, where phi in this case is actually Euler's totient function, the function that computes the number of integers coprime um, that are less than n. All right, and that's actually why we use this capital phi to denote it in that situation. Now, over other fields, uh, these things can look very, very differently. In fact, um, over the rational field, this polynomial phi of n contains as its roots all of the all of the primitive nth roots of unity. But over other fields, um, they can actually split into more than one. Uh, more than one class. That is, you have some primitive roots over here, some other primitive roots that have the same degree. Uh, and so it gets a little bit more complicated, but still we'll refer to this as the nth cyclic tonic polynomial. Um, now, I should mention, why why are we talking about this right now? Um, 
let's note that roots of unity are actually very important in this in field theory in particular they're important in our discussion of cyclic codes that'll be the basis upon these roots of unity will be where we're going to define our bch codes from so let f be a finite field and if zeta is an nth root of unity you're still going to have this relationship zeta n equals one and this is true um for for every uh for every field, right, whether you're finite or infinite, it doesn't really matter. This statement is going to hold true right there. But in the case of a finite field, I want you to remember that if f here is finite, then f star, remember, is going to equal, let's say that this is order n right here. This is going to be isomorphic to the, gr the cyclic group Zn minus 1 right and so this right here says something about the order of zeta inside of f star if we think of it f star as this cyclic group um well this tells you that the order of zeta is going to divide n now if it's a primitive uh in root of unity then the order of zeta multiplicatively speaking is exactly n uh but by lagrange's theorem it's going to divide that and so that's like we saw earlier how a third root of unity is a sixth root of unity and so uh, as we study this cyclic group, we see that F star contains, it definitely contains an element of order N, if and only if we get um, that N divides the order here. So let me, let me clean this up a little bit. Uh, typically, when we come to these finite fields, we think of it as P to the K, of course. So that means F star as a cyclic group is going to be F to the P to the K minus 1. Um, and so... If zeta is a primitive nth root of unity, then that means that n must divide p to the k minus 1. So how you factor this power of prime tells you a lot So about the field. And so if the order of f is p to the k, um, that field will contain nth roots of unity if and only if n divides p to the k minus 1. And so... It, we might be interested in is f a splitting field for the polynomial x to the n minus one or not so the splitting field the splitting field for this polynomial x to the n minus one is going to be the smallest power of k such that n divides p to the k minus one and so that gives us the splitting field so for example um let me slide up a little bit more so I can write this out here. So, for example, um, if we look at the polynomial x to the 15th minus 1, uh, this splits over um, f16, of course. Uh, clearly, clearly um, 16 minus 1 is 15. 15 divides 15. And so you are going to get that x to the 15 minus 1 splits over f16 right here and we can also argue that this is in fact the uh smallest field finite field uh, of characteristic two for which x to the 15 minus one splits right because if you look at the other ones like f8 um that's it's way too small um 15 is bigger than eight same thing with four two as well so this is in fact the splitting field for this polynomial this tells us that f16 contains all of the uh, fifth, all the 15th roots of unity, um, which include, of course, the primitive 15th roots of unity. We also get the primitive fifth roots, the primitive third roots, and then, of course, the primitive uh, first root as well. And we're actually going to we're going to build a BCH code uh, using the factorization of x to the 15th minus 1. Again, we'll do this at the end of this video, of course. So over a field for which x to the n minus 1 does not split, Notice that x to the n minus 1 will factor into irreducible factors, of course, uh, because our polynomial rings are still going to be unique factorization domains. Uh, so, like, for example, f to the 15 minus 1 splits over f16, but what if we look at the field um, f2, z2? It's not going to split over that field because, again, it doesn't contain the primitive 15th roots of unity, so it'll factor into some collection of irreducibles. So if p of x is an irreducible factor of x to the n minus 1, then one of its roots is a primitive uh, dth root of unity for some divisor of n. So note that necessarily the other roots of p of x must be other primitive dth roots of unity, but it doesn't necessarily have to be all of them. So when we factor this thing, 
um, into its irreducible factors, whether it's x to the 15 minus 1 or in general x to the n minus 1. When we factor it, in particular, when we factor it over z2, which is the prime field for all of these um, characteristic two finite fields, when we factor it here, it's going to give you a bunch of irreducible factors. And the roots of those factors are going to be in the roots of unity. Um, and let's say that when you have one of those factors here, uh, you have some p of x times some other things, right? You look at p of x, its roots are going to be um, nth roots of unity. And let's say that they're primitive dth roots of unity, where d is a divisor of n. Um, all the other roots inside of p will also have to be primitive dth roots of unity, which will be... Um, root in roots of unity, not necessarily primitive though. But be aware, unlike the rationals, it doesn't have to contain all of their roots. This is something we're gonna see in the future. Now, speaking of irreducible polynomials and roots, um, this is an appropriate time to bring up a very useful proposition. Um, suppose that F is a finite field of order P to the K, so clearly it's characteristic P, P is a prime here. And suppose we have some polynomial F of X inside of the polynomial field, uh, the polynomial ring, I should say, um, F of joint X, and let E be the splitting field for this polynomial F of X. So E contains all of the roots of F of X, and let's say one of those roots is omega. So if omega is a root of f of x, then it turns out that omega to the p to the k power is likewise a root. That is, if you take omega um, and raise it to the order of the finite field f, that gives you another root of the same polynomial. And so this can be particularly useful when your base field is just the prime field. So you're looking at, for example, zp. Um, this tells you that if omega is a root, of your irreducible polynomial, then omega to the p is also a root, and then that to the p power, and then that to the p power. Um, eventually, this process will cycle around, but this potentially could grab you, it will gar grab you other roots of the polynomial, and potentially it could give you all of the other roots of the polynomial. And so that'll be very, very nice. We're, of course, going to prove it in the more general case where f is a finite field of order p to the k, but our primary emphasis will be when we have the prime field uh, zp right there. So, okay, let's look at our polynomial f of x. Let's say the coefficients are uh, c0, c1, c2 up to cn, right? So our polynomial looks like c0 plus c1x plus c2x squared all the way up to cn x to the n like so. And so then if we evaluate this at our root omega, for which, again, omega is just any number in, uh, it could be any any number, right, in, this, in these finite fields. It doesn't necessarily have to be a, a root of unity, although, of course, roots of unity will be our ultimate focus as we develop this theory for BCH codes. So you look at the polynomial f, um, f of omega, in which case evaluation just means you plug in omega for each of the x's, right? We get that. And since it's a root, this evaluation should equal zero. Fantastic. So we have this equation right here. Consider um, the polynomial evaluated at omega p to the k. Well, then evaluation looks something like the following. Now, previously we have seen that with finite fields, that if you raise an element of a finite field to the order of that finite field, this actually acts like the identity on uh, that element, right? So Fermat's little theorem is often represented over the finite field ZP, but this works for any finite field whatsoever, that if you have a belonging to a finite field, if you take A and raise it to the order of that finite field, this in fact gives you back A inside of that field. Uh, so raising an element to the order of the field is like the identity of that field. So as each of these coefficients, C0, C1, up to Cn, as all of these belong to the field F, if I raise them to the order of F, which is P to the K, that won't do anything to them. So C0 is the same thing as C0 to the PK. C1 is the same thing as C1 to the PK. But as you then have C1 to the PK times omega to the PK, we can factor that as C1 times omega to the PK. And then you continue on like so. All right. So then as we are working over a field of characteristic P, what we can then do is we can actually use freshman exponentiation um, on these things, as long as we're taking powers of p, which is exactly what we're doing. So this will then turn into c naught plus c1 omega 
plus going all the way down, we're going to have a CN omega to the N right here, all raised to the P kth power. We're allowed to do that because we're working uh, mod P in this finite field. But this right here is just F of omega. Like so, we just have F omega to the PK power. Well, since o F omega is zero, we have then zero to the PK power, and any finite power of zero is gonna likewise be zero as well. So this then establishes the fact that if you have a root of a polynomial, that means any, uh, over a finite field, then the root raised to the order of that base field for which the coefficients are coming from for the polynomial will also give you another root. And this will be very, very, very helpful for us. So for example, if we look at the cyclic tonic um, polynomial, we'll say z uh, phi 15 of x here, and we are looking for this polynomial, well clearly one of its roots, we're looking at the splitting field right now, one of this roots is going to be um, zeta, where zeta is a primitive 15th root of unity. And then by this proposition here, since we're working mod two, so we're thinking of this over the field uh, Z2 here, that means Z squared will be another root. And then you're gonna have Z to the fourth is another root. And then you're gonna have Z to the eighth, which is another root. Then of course, when you take Z16, because these are primitive 15th roots of unity, uh, Z16 is the same thing as sorry, zeta 16, this is the same thing as zeta 15 times zeta to the first. Zeta to the 15th is one, so this just gives you back zeta. So as you cycle through this, uh, you're gonna get that zeta is a root, so is zeta squared, so is zeta to the fourth, so is zeta to the eighth. And then uh, it cycles back, are there any other roots? Well, we'll need another argument, but sure enough, we can prove that uh, phi 15 has degree four over z squared, and thus this accommodates for all of the roots. So we can find a complete factorization utilizing uh, this proposition with, with, of course, if we know the degree of the polynomial. But we'll talk about that a little bit more next time.